from the studios of TV Grace International. Here are the ineffable words of God. The Gospel of Grace on the lips of the man Christ Jesus. Abba Father, It says, on that day Jesus had gone out of the house and was sitting by the sea, and large crowds gathered to him. So he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. Then he spoke many things to them in. Keep that in mind, in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, what happened? They withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out but others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus was speaking in parables, and parables never yield any fruit in anyone. He was not talking about that time. He was in the middle of speaking when the gospel of the uncircumcision was said to be preached. In other words, he was talking about this time. Because now you hear the word and the word itself is what makes you bear fruit. It says some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. But that never happened. In Paul's time, no one bore fruit. Everyone abandoned him. Is it so or not? The Bible says, they all forsook me. And after my departure, it is finished. It means they bore no fruit. Following Paul for approximately 1,900 years, the darkness of truth descended, bringing diversity, numerous religions, countless interpretations, and eventually apostasy. It means that this was never fulfilled. That parable never came true. There were no people who bore fruit at 30 or 60. That never happened. Jesus of Nazareth spoke in parables, no. He actually said, I use parables so they won't understand. How then were they to bear fruit to 30 to 60 if he himself spoke in parables so that they would not understand? And Paul could not because he had the 11 apostles there refuting everything he did and they were against him. And whatever Paul spoke, James came and John would come and Peter would come and say, Paul says the devil was destroyed, but Peter would say, no, the devil walks like a roaring lion. And Paul says, it is only by faith. But James says, you see, it is not by faith alone, you have to work. In other words, Paul had a struggle. No one bore fruit there, not even 30. Timothy did bear fruit, but he died and could no longer speak. He chickened out. After he was a faithful example, he chickened out. Timothy was never heard from again. Paul said, look, here the key is this. God always works with a man. With Moses, the law stood firm, with just one man. With Paul, grace stood firm, but he died and it ended. Moses died and it's over. Once the representative dies, it's over. So I have the beautiful privilege that this parable for the first time began in the growing in grace ministry to bear fruit a hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirtyfold. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. Observe that this is returning to the story once more. Notice how it was presented there. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Here the evangelical says it was lost. No. <laughs> that it bears no fruit, not that it was lost. 
as Paul explains there, who says, he will suffer loss, but he is saved. But it says he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Two measures are there, right? Fruit, more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. However, that word did not clean. He was. He was talking about the future here. Yes, see, he spoke in parables. Number one, he hadn't died there yet. Nobody was clean. Everybody was under the sin of Adam. Until the cross, everybody was a sinner. And not for bad behavior, but for the head representative, Adam. Everyone was a sinner. Now he is saying there, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. No one was clean. Everyone was still under Adam. There he was talking about what was going to happen. About the future, we return to the future again. Because sometimes he spoke and you thought it was for that time. No, this is for later because for him, one day is like a thousand years. He says, okay, we're on day one. In two days, this will happen. 3,000 years later. I mean, 2,000 years. In other words, that is why time, Paul said, look, time is a rudiment. Because we have the time factor, but on the spiritual plane, there is no calendar, no clocks, because everything is now an eternal now. It is now here, the day of salvation, that is an eternal now. The issue is that we have a damaged mindset shaped by the education we've received in this corrupt system. For we judge everything with the carnal mind. It is impossible that a thousand years have gone by, yet the angel takes you and tells you. How did the prophet express? In two days and on the third day, I will give you life. In other words, in that world where they will very soon transform this body we have. <laughs> there are things we cannot say yet because they are not written down. It says things that the eye has not seen, nor ear heard. This means you won't be able to hear them. <laughs> Look, things that eye has not seen nor ear heard are what God has prepared for those who pass through the furnace. Those who allow their measure to be taken. There are some wonderful things, but if I tell you now, you will say, wait, even though I want to leave, I'd better stay. <laughs> Yes, because if they alert you, there are people who are no longer hungry, but if they are told, there's some rice over there. <laughs> some eat twice. They create room and everything necessary to enjoy more food. Where were we? In which verse did we stay? Remain in me and I in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, did you see that this is not your business? But you need to be given a word that contains the food to take that measure. And it was never given before, because the mediator had not appeared. There is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, and he was not there. He wasn't around. What am I doing here? I'm mediating for you. Look, this is how it goes. This is how it goes. That's what I do, mediate, and that wasn't there before. You could hear Reverend so-and-so from all the theologians, including Spurgeon and Charles Finney, from all those individuals who were the men that prayed and caused the snow to melt away. You can melt whatever you want. If you don't know the gospel of uncircumcision, that doesn't go beyond the ceiling. From all those American theologians, German theologians, all of them I say, as Paul mentioned, I was not informed of anything new. The church also received no new information. 
This is the work of the man Christ Jesus. That's the way it is. Hey, this is really getting good. Remain in me and I in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but must remain in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in him. He had nothing good to give, just to shed blood. Well, nearly nothing. To forgive your sins, however, you could not remain in him. This is about the future. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who resides in me and I in him bears. Now it's not just fruit, it's a lot of fruit. But it is necessary to mediate, it is necessary to give you information. You should be given a gospel that was hidden for 2,000 years. This gospel yields fruit, more fruit and plenty of fruit. That is what Grace's word accomplishes. I have clear news to share. What you are hearing today will happen right in front of you. It will never occur. Since Jesus of Nazareth, this has never been fulfilled. Today it is revealed before your eyes. Today, today it is made known. I am missing a biblical verse, Galatians. Hey, not I. If I separate myself from me, there is nothing I can do. Even I need me in order to save myself as well. Well, it's like Jesus of Nazareth, if I don't die. If I choose not to go to the cross, my fate remains to stay here and perish like any other individual. And then Satan would have lived forever. He would have kept the entire project. He had, the key was, mine is to die. Mine is life. <laughs> well, <laughs> is that each veil plays its role the same spirit that resided in Moses spoke, saying, what I have to offer is death and condemnation. And he had to be loyal to that. It condemned you, it took your life, and it finished you off. That veil fulfilled its function. Jesus' thing was, mine is not to condemn or do anything. Mine is to die, and he died. And my thing is to live as long as I can until the whole project on earth is fulfilled. Yeah. Galatians 5.16 Harvest time. That's how it is. I say then, walk in the measure. Walk in the 30th, the 60th, or the 100th percent. But walk in that measure. And you shall not fulfill the desire of the flesh. What a project. So good are the desires of the flesh. Everything is lawful for me, but not everything is convenient. Ah, but is it forbidden here? No, it is not forbidden here. Here it is forbidden to prohibit. Everything is lawful for you. And since you already have a measure and it's outside, they can say to you, look, I permit you to go and do this. However, because you have a measure, the measure states self-dominion with this not commandments, self-dominion. So you with self-dominion, you try to the extent you can. And if you don't have your self-dominion, it's because your measure is weak. You are called to conquer. Ah, but I messed up once, so try to ensure that you don't on the second time. This is not about how many times you have failed. The idea is for you to be victorious, that he who began the work in you will perfect it. A 30 is fantastic. I'm satisfied with a 30, a 30 well executed. Verse 17. 
for the desire of the flesh is programmed to go against your spirit. Now it deals with the measure. If the measure of yours is standing. It's typical for the flesh to seek to hurt you, whether by killing you or annoying you for life. It troubles you to make you a truly troubled being that is approved by the kingdom of the flesh. The flesh is loyal to its job up to the maximum. Its aim is to hurt you as much as it can. <laughs> That's the way of the flesh. If the flesh could harm you, right now if it could kill you, it does so that the measure doesn't come out. The flesh is no good. That's why I told you last week that if you tell me, look, you know everything that happened to me. I won't be surprised what happened to you because that is normal for a human being unless you are from another planet. But if you are a human being, you might experience things that are incredibly bad and unfortunate. Because you are a human being, you have provision for that. But the call is not to look at what the flesh does because we already know that. The flesh will bring surprises. Oh, and the more grace you hear, the more the flesh objects because you flaunt it. Look, look, and it will bring you situations. But if your measure, that 30, is well accented with good grace, don't miss the conferences. Even if you arrive half asleep here, come. Invest in this. Because this will help you to give strength to that measure. Now pay attention to what it says and against what does the spirit oppose. Which spirit? The one that has the manifested measure. If there's nothing in you, if you have nothing in you, how will you defend? Sometimes you know some neighbors. I don't know how you survived before coming here. But you hear some neighbors, oh poor thing, look. He is facing a situation and sometimes they talk to you saying, look, I'm getting out of one situation just to get into another and I have some problems. That is what is normal. If they don't have the spirit to defend themselves, the flesh takes them and destroys them. Do you think they will be happy without this word? Then they contradict God. No one outside of this word can, especially remember that this word began in 73 and it began with me. This means that it is 33 years old. It's just starting. This ministry is at the start. This is just getting started. Moreover, this is almost like when Jesus said, don't tell anyone. He healed someone and told him, don't tell yet. It is not the time because this is just getting started. This ministry is just beginning. It's like when the plane leaves and rises. You check to see if it has taken off and for a moment, everything is calm. While it's on the runway, there's a lot of turbulence. But when it takes off, sometimes it does a couple of things that can surprise you. The aircraft is in this position, but it still hasn't reached an altitude of 38,000 feet. It is there, but it needs to be calm, which is when you get sleepy, you lie down and you see the clouds so beautiful and you enjoy the trip. Now we're going to do that. The landing, that's a whole other story. <laughs> Verse 17. <clears throat> For the desires of the flesh, we understand it now. It's not Satan. Hello? The devil made me do this. No, no. There's no devil here that matters. That newspaper is incredibly ancient. It's old news. Say, it's the flesh. You can't blame anyone. It's that so-and-so, that one. It's your flesh, the flesh. Against the spirit. But it's important to understand 
that the spirit is opposed to the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. The flesh desires one thing, the spirit desires another. But if you are led by the spirit, if you are guided by the measure, be it 30, 60, or 100, you are not under the law. We are not under the law, right? And why do evangelicals say that the law stands? Because they lack a measure. They lack a word that sharpens them. What they hear is the old covenant that David mentioned, that Moses spoke of, and that Peter referred to, that Revelation states. So that doesn't offer a measure, because that is an empty word that dulls the senses. It doesn't give a measure. Do you know why? It doesn't give you freedom. Freedom. To take your measurements, first I have to tell you, look, do what you wish. But what if I get lost? No, you won't get lost. What if a demon? No, there are no demons. So I'm free? Yes, you're free. Go away. It's like the baby. To the baby you say, don't eat that, but it's a cake. <laughs> With ice cream beside it, you say, don't eat that. But what do you mean, don't eat? And then the child is filled with anger. Yet someone else approaches and tells him, devour it all. And he puts his face in and does this. <laughs> next time he goes and eats a little, then the next time he eats less until he expects you to serve him. It is a purpose, but there has to be freedom. Where the Spirit of God resides, there is liberty. If there is no freedom, there is no growth. As long as the church is, watch out for this. Beware of drugs. Beware of the devil. Beware of that and beware of everything. There is no growth there because the commandment does not improve anything. A couple just told me, Apostle, look, my son is graduating and he can leave and arrive at any time he wants, but he doesn't want to. He wants to come early. It's good that there are parents like that. My love, I trust in you. You have been edified, you have been edified. Go to the little party. But that of saying, be careful with this. No, don't be careful. Go to the little party. Behave badly. <laughs> it is like this. Freedom has two edges. And one of its edges is that it takes the measure out of you. So I encourage you to keep listening to the conferences and to keep listening to me if you can. If that interests you, and if you don't, don't come anymore. Look, we don't take attendance here. We don't give credit for the number of times you come. <laughs> you are free. You are able to do anything you desire. But remember that all things are lawful for you, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Welcome to the Congregation of the Free. <laughs>